everybody, welcome here at the presentation about creating uh, user-friendly Joomla websites and forms for that matter. Um, I want to talk to you about how people use the internet nowadays um, and I want to discuss some usability problems and what you can do about it. Um, and I'm going to end up with some forms because forms are very important on the internet. Um, there's a lot of questions in everyday life. When you go to a restaurant, it's always the question whether you can just go to a table and take a seat or if you have to be taken to your seat. Uh, same thing goes for bars. Um, when you're in a, in a pub, um, it's always the question if you have to get your own beer or if, or if they're serving beer. Um, one of the biggest questions I always have in just regular, uh, regular uh, day life is how to use an elevator. Because elevators are pretty, pretty hard. It should be really easy. When you get to an elevator, you should just uh, go there, push a button, get into the elevator, um, then push a button again, wait a little while, the doors open and you get out. However, um, mostly it's not the case. Um, can everybody please uh, put a hand up if you've ever been in an elevator before? <laughs> All right, cool. Um, and who's had trouble finding the button for the right floor? Yeah, that's a lot of people. You get things like this. It's a little confusing to me. I think the, the, in the middle two are buttons. Um, and they're all different things. There's two arrows pointing to the side, and here's one with a bar in between. I'm, I'm not sure what the difference is between the two. If you look at the code for uh, the Briar code for people with no sight, it's actually it's just actually the same, so there's no difference. Why do we need difference as people who can actually see something? So you just press the button and hope something will happen. Um, then once you're inside, you get stuff like this most of the time. And there's a floor four and four R. I don't know the difference. There's ventilators. Um, what else? Big axes and, and, and bells. It's really yeah, it's really confusing to me. Just give me a floor. Um, I'm not the only one who doesn't really like elevators. My colleague uh, Theo here, he's not really fond of them either. And for the last couple of years we wanted to write some books and one of those books is actually this one. We already got the, the cover and the title ready. We didn't write it yet, maybe it'll come to it. But we think this book could be really helpful in, the, in this world. For example, take this, um, this elevator. Who thinks uh, you should press the uh, lower button on this thing to get the elevator? Okay, so half of us would press the lower button and the other half would press the, the top button. Um, the top button is actually for help. And they found out that a lot of people were using the top button so there were a lot of emergency calls in this hotel or bar or whatever it was. Um, and if you, there's actually there's, uh, there's French words right there. So if, you, if you're French, you can actually read it and it's all right. But everybody who doesn't understand French has got a problem with this elevator. So this guy, this company, they started reading our imaginary book. And he created this. Just two great yellow arrows, press me, press me. Plus they have a hand there for service and it says assistance or in English assistance. So you get a lot more people who understand what they actually have to do. Way better. Um, there is actually, a, not one book, uh, a lot of books about how to create uh, user-friendly websites. And one of my favorite books is this one from Steve Crook, Don't Make Me Think. Uh, title is really clear. Please don't let the user think. Plus, he says, it's a, 
I, I, he's, he's wrote, he wrote this book with a common sense approach to web usability. So what he's saying is think about what you're doing. If you, if you create a back button on your website with uh, arrows pointing to the right, it's not really, it's not really convenient. It's, the back button should have uh, arrows pointing to the left because you're going back and not forward. Um, if you've got um, important text on your website, don't underline it because people will expect it's, it's a link and it's not a link. If something is important, uh, give it another color, make it bold or something like that. Make it stand out in another way than underlining. Um, here's a, an example of a website which is really funny because it's a UX magazine, a user experience magazine and they get this website. They changed it now, they knew it was not the best website to have. But what's going on here? There's a lot of, lot of blocks. Um, there are some commercials, but I'm not sure which ones are commercials and which ones are not. There is a menu, but it's not on the best spot of the website, I think. So there's a lot of things going on. It's not really clear. Um, as I said, they changed the website because they, they also knew this was not the best website for a user experience magazine. Let me take some water. Because now I want to talk to you about uh, how people surf the internet nowadays. And the first thing we do is we, um, we go through websites with 100 kilometers per hour. Everything goes really, really fast. When the internet was still new, everybody was taking his time. Everybody was just doing it very slowly. Because you read a paper and you got a URL, you went to your, uh, to your browser, um, you went to the website and you hoped to find some information. Um, people didn't know search engines that well. There, there weren't, search engines were not that popular back then, not that widely used. So if you were at a website, uh, chances were big that you would stay there and find whatever you wanted on that particular website because you didn't know how to get the information elsewhere. Um, also, if on that website it, said, it had a button and it said click me, I would actually click it because I thought I had to click it to get the information I wanted. I, I didn't know there was advertisement or anything. It's really funny because my, my father is actually just starting to work with computers right now. Um, and he started with uh, an iPad and a, a laptop. But he uses the iPad more because it's, it's easier for him. Uh, and he's still going really slowly because he, he's got no idea what's going on. He has to read everything. And I was explaining Google Maps to him uh, a few months ago. Um, and I, I did that on my, uh, on my MacBook. So I was, I was showing around. He wanted to know some stuff, so I told him. And all of a sudden I was like, um, Dad, if you want to do that, you have to click here. And I pointed my finger to the, to the MacBook screen. And the first thing he did was get his hand off the trackpad and press the screen. And he would hope something would happen. Of course, nothing happened. Um, but it's, it's way more logical to, to use the screen and to do stuff directly on your screen than using a mouse or a trackpad or whatever. Um, of course, they didn't have the technology yet all those uh, years ago, so a trackpad and a mouse were, were good tools to use it. Um, but touch screens are better and way more usable for users, for most cases, not everything, of course. Um, another thing is quite similar, is that we are always in a hurry. So we're not only uh, really fast, but we're also in a hurry and looks like the same, but there's actually a difference. Uh, if, we, if you drive somewhere with your car really fast to get lunch, um, at least the, the least thing you can do is take, you know, take your time to eat your lunch, right? But when you are surfing on the internet, there's no time to eat that lunch either. If you, if you found an article on the, on a, um, you search via Google and you wanted to know something and you actually found the article, um, people don't read the whole article. What they do is, is they scan everything to find what they want and if they found it, then they leave immediately. There's no time to read everything. It could be really um, important and and helpful for you to, to read the whole article to understand everything, but it's not the case. We just scan and we, uh, we're really in a hurry. 
Third point, we scan, we focus, uh, and why are we doing this? Why are we not just reading the whole website? It's because there's just too much information on every website now. If you got a homepage, everybody wants everything on their homepage. It's, it's not just a piece of information, everything has to be pushed into that one homepage. If there's a new social media platform coming out, such as uh, Pinterest, for example, people immediately want to put it in. They're not considering whether it's good for their company or good for their website. Everybody is starting to use it, so they think we need it as well, and they put it on the website. Uh, if you put everything on a website that is uh, going around in this web world, you get really busy websites, which is going on uh, for most of the websites nowadays. If this is all too hard for you, and for the users, the back button, door number two, is always very close. So you got the back button, or the backspace, or a swipe to the left or the right. It's really easy for users to leave your website. If they can't find what they're looking for, they'll be gone and uh, going back to Google or another search engine to, to find what they want on another website. And if this is all too hard for you guys, if you think I can't reach my, um, I can't reach my visitors on the website on anything, uh, on any level anymore because when they visit my website they are gone immediately if I don't do something right, you can always work um, at the conveyor belt because that's really easy to do. It's no, uh, nothing hard like building a website. Plus you can wear an awesome cap like him and me for that matter. So what can we do to actually reach those visitors? What can we do to make sure that they find the information that they're looking for? Well, we can test, right? You can test your website and you can see whether the people uh, are finding what they're looking for. This guy is really proud of his, lab, of, of his testing lab. I'd be proud too if I were him. Uh, but this is of course expensive. And it doesn't have to be expensive. You can do testing yourself. There's, um, there's also a lot of tools available on the internet, like uh, Usabilla or Silverback or uh, Crazy Egg. Um, it's all software you can use. It also costs a little money to test your websites. But if we take it a step back, you can also just test your website with somebody else in the same room, like this guy is doing, but then with just a couple of hours and a couple of bucks per month. Because what you should do is just um, get somebody you know, a father, a brother, a friend, a relative, whatever, uh, and grab your MC Shark laptop. Uh, just sit with, with the other people in the same room and let them just serve your website. You, you can either let them just serve on your website and see what they're doing, or you could give them a specific task, um, like uh, can you find, find the most read blogs, or could you please try to sign up on this website or buy a product from us? So there's two, two, things, two different things you can do. Just give them a specific task to see how they react to that, or just let them surf around a little bit and see what they're, what they're going on your website. Because there's a path on every website that most people take, um, so you can see what, what that path is, if it's going to the right direction. If you want them to buy a product, the path should be to buy a product and not to uh, uh, take contact with you because they don't understand it. So step one is just sit together and, and see what's going on. But you shouldn't only watch what's going on. You could also film it like this guy. But an easier way is just to grab a pencil and a piece of paper and write everything down. So. What you should ask to the person who is surfing on your website is if they, if they think of anything, um, ask them to say it out loud. So everything that your user is thinking, uh, he's saying that as well and you can write it down. Uh, of course, no one ever is really saying everything they're thinking. Um, and in certain moments, uh, people are looking into a certain direction or moving their mouse into a cer certain direction. That's something that they won't tell you. 
but that is something that you can see. So when you're doing this, when you're sitting with someone, pay real close attention to what he's doing, because the more you write down, uh, the handier it is for you at the end. Then there's, of course, the step of implementing everything you've seen this user doing. This is uh, a difficult picture, to, at least for me, when I saw it for the first time. This is one kitchen from two sides, and this is the same kitchen, but then with the improvements uh, that they found out, as an example. Um, so they changed a lot. Apparently, these people wanted a bigger ki kitchen because they took out this whole unit and uh, took the space. Um, when you are doing this, when you are uh, testing and uh, making improvements, make sure that you always start with only three users at the first time. At your first testing round, only take two or three users. Because if you immediately start with ten users, they will find a lot of, um, a lot of problems. Uh, ten users will find more problems than just three users. However, the three users will find about 75% uh, of all the uh, problems available on the, on the website. And the 10 users will probably find about 80, 85 to 90%. But if you, if you test with three users, you find the 75%, you uh, actually implement those uh, suggestions, um, and you test it again with a new version, with three users again, they again will find 75% of the new problems and the existing problems that were, weren't found at the first round. So if you do that again, if you uh, make the changes again and do a test with three users again, and they will find 75% again, you get a lot more out of it than just throw 10 users in at the first round and only fix 80%. So it's always wise to, to start and do rounds with a um, few users and not that many because you can use those users for, for other rounds. Next up, I want to talk about some usability problems um, on websites nowadays. I think I got five or six. And the first problem uh, that websites have is that they are really, really slow. A slow website is never good. People know that there could be fast websites because there are a lot of fast websites around. So if your website is slow, they don't blame your server or the software you use, but they blame you, because it could be done. It could be fast. So always make sure that you got a fast website. Well, what can you do about that? You can reduce the amount of images you use, uh, amount of JavaScript files and CSS files, uh, minify everything. There's a lot of <coughs> things you can do that way. Um, images is a really easy one to start with. If you've got a lot of super large images on a web page that are only there for decoration, you can just remove them uh, and it will save a lot of uh, kilobytes. There's a handy tool you can use to see how you can improve the speed of your website and things you can do. And it's called Why Slow. It's available for, I think, everything except Internet Explorer. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but this is um, this is the Joomla.org website, and this they got a, a grade C with a performance score of 75, which is uh, pretty all right. Uh, and as you can see, it will show you some things that you can do to improve the speed of your website. So they got a D for uh, HTTP requests because they have seven external style sheets and 11 external background images. If you create image sprites, there will be less images, so a faster loading website. But one thing I think Joomla can really increase their speed is by using a content delivery network because Joomla wants to be international um, and they've got a lot of international uh, visitors. So why not use a content delivery network? I'm not a technical guy, but I'm going to try to explain it a little bit. Um, when you got a regular website, you got a server somewhere in a country and you put all your files on there. If, for example, we got a, a website in Holland and somebody in America visits our website, he's got to make a lot of hops from America to, to Holland to get the content. 
if you are using a, a CDN, a content delivery network, then your files are located on several servers on the world. And if you visit the website from America, it will find the closest server near to where you are visiting the website from. So that means less hops and uh, you, get, you get your stuff really, uh, really much faster. So I think that could be done uh, there. Um, this is our website. Of course, you have to brag a little bit. We only get a 99% score, and that's because uh, I highlighted, I think, yeah, uh, Google Analytics is, uh, if you want to use Google Analytics, you can get the 100% score. And if we don't use Google Analytics, my colleague Theo will get really mad. So we never get a 100% score, but hey. Another problem is Flash. Who in this room has got an iDevice? And a mobile iDevice. All right. Flash is not working on your iDevices, right? So if there's a website completely created in Flash, you can't see anything. There's just nothing there. And these iDevices have been around for a couple of years now. But there's still websites being created entirely in Flash, or just parts of websites created in Flash. Uh, and it's not working for, for us if we, uh, if we visit them uh, if, if we visit the websites on the other devices. Um, most of the time that's not a problem because you also have a desktop computer around, but um, if you are somewhere else and you only have your eye device, you can't see anything. Um, so it's a shame that people are still doing these things in Flash. The only people who don't do this anymore are the people who create banners. Um, they used to use Flash a lot because everything was moving. And there are new technologies now, like uh, HTML5 and CSS3 combined with JavaScript, as you probably all know. And those companies who should actually, well, they found out those new techniques. So the only thing you get moving on your iDevice are banners, which is really irritating. So what can we do about Flash? Don't use Flash. It's really, it's that easy. Because there are those new techniques, and you can do a lot of things with them. For example, this, uh, this is a screenshot made on, uh, on an iPad. Um, and this thing is moving around. If you want to see it, here's the, uh, the URL, and the sheets will be online, so you can check it out later. Um, this thing is moving around, and when you click it or just uh, tap it, then there will be a random picture. It's a crazy example, but it's working on your right device instead of uh, using Flash. Here's another one. Um, but this, this says what you can do, right? But not everything that is stated here is working on an iDevice. Because you can't shake a browser. You can shake your device, but it's not the same as shaking a browser. So if they, if they would code that, that it would work on an, on an iDevice as well, it, it could be working, but right now this is not working. Uh, and you don't have a keyboard on your iPad or iPhone, so this is not working either. However, you can double tap and the bubbles will split and you can move, move them around. So not everything is working. And I'm also not saying that you should completely ban Flash because not everything um, is better in HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript, and not everything is being viewed on an iPad or an, uh, or an iDevice in, in general. For example, there are some, uh, some services in Flash, created in Flash, that mimic Photoshop. Um, and if you want to do that in HTML5, CSS3, it, it will be a nightmare task. So that's just, just been done in Flash. And you, you're not using a, a Photoshop copy thing on your iPhone because it's just too small. You can't do anything there. So probably nobody's going to use it on an iDevice anyway. So if, if you create things like that, you could better use Flash, in my opinion. But if you are creating a website, just a regular website, don't use Flash. The next one is 404 pages. And this is what you get when you go to google.com slash jmbeyond, because it doesn't exist. And you get this 404 page. And it says, that's an error. Uh, that's all we know. If I'm visiting this website, I can't do anything else. I have no idea where to go. 
I should use the back button, that's, that's my only way out. But it would be better if you give a user some options on your error page. For example, this is Google, so they could easily place a search engine there. So you can just continue. You don't have to use the back button, but you can continue and search what you were looking for. So I made this. It's just the, a, a copy, a screenshot from google.com, uh, completely with the, uh, with the links at the bottom. If they just place this here, then a user could easily just uh, continue where they were stranded. Here's another example uh, of a 404 page. Looks, uh, looks nice, but it also has the, uh, the links in the top to, to give the user uh, a way out of this page instead of the back button. Another thing you could do is just um, put the whole layout of your website around it, like this example. He's just got everything uh, on his normal website. He got it around it, but then in the middle, it's just uh, the, the part of the arrow. And it is clear that something has gone wrong because there's a page not found. And he's got a search, search box there as well. So this is uh, it's great to do. Give your user an opportunity to do something else and just uh, close the website or use the back button. This one is about menus. There's a lot, of, a lot of options right there. Because here are the most popular categories. Um, and here are all the categories. But what's actually making this, this thing too busy is the use of, of, of screaming advertisements on the bottom and the top. Users don't want that many options. Users don't like options. People don't like options. If you go to, to the mall and there's two, two shops who sell shoes and the one shop only sells the three, pair, three pairs of shoes, it's an easy choice for all of you to choose one of those three pairs if you like them at all. Because if you don't like them at all, you'll be gone. But if you like any one of them, it's, it's an easy choice to make because there's only three. If the other uh, shop has got like a uh, hundred pairs of shoes, it's it's a mammoth task, because you got 100 pairs. Where do you start? What do you do? And that, that's where the, the salesman come in, because the salesman will ask you, uh, OK, what kind of uh, style of shoes do you like? Uh, what kind of color are you looking for? Uh, what's your shoe size? Um, and then he will present you with three pairs of shoes, probably the most expensive ones, but three pairs of shoes uh, that you can choose from. And then it's an easier choice for you to make. A lot of choice is not always good. So I gave it a shot. There's still a lot of things right there. But at least I took the advertisement out. I took all the, um, all the, the blocks, all the um, things that are in the way of actually doing what you are supposed to be doing. So I think it would be best if, we, if you would just take these out and only have a nice <coughs> list of all the other items or reduce your items. However, if you want to use advertisement within your menu because your boss says you have to, it is possible on a nice way, like Amazon is showing. OK, it's a huge advertisement, but it's not as ugly as this one or that one. It just looks good. You got your menu, and it's not really, you can't really see it there, I think, but uh, there's some light gray dividers uh, in between those items. So it's a nice way to present your information and your menu links, um, which you can, it's still, it's still really very clear where you should click. If you want something with, uh, with movies, you start at the top, music is in the middle, and then video games are at the, at the bottom, and you've got a huge uh, advertisement, which is not ugly. So it's, it's, uh, it's great there. Another great example is the website of Joomla, uh, which Kyle did a few months ago. You just get clear, clear drop downs with dividers and everything in it. It's not, not a great mess, which is good. Then we got advertisement. This is not a menu. These are ads. And I've looked it up in the code, because I think they're using some sort of template. Um, these advertisements are actually placed in a div called menu. So this it should be the menu, but they just place their advertisement in there. 
the website is it's actually it's just this this header here a piece of information and the rest is just is just advertisement it's maybe it's a little bit extreme because most of the website don't have this much advertisement but the m most advertisement on websites is really ugly and it's in the way but of course those people want to make some money so no, I made it a little bit better, took all the uh, most, um, the advertisement that was most in the way, I just took it out and, well, they can make a little money here on the site. But they're still really ugly. I've got an example here of TechCrunch, who also has advertisement on this page. It's right here in the lower right corner. It says sponsored link, so it, it's, it's actually saying that, that there's an advertisement there. It's not making the users think that it's uh, content of the website. It shows them that, that it's sponsored, so it's, it's an advertisement. But it fits in with the rest of the website, so it's, it, it looks a little better, looks a little nicer. Not screaming like the other, uh, other example. So we had a book about elevators, well, almost, maybe. <coughs> there was a book about uh, usability. And then there's also a book dedicated to web forms which uh, Luke W. wrote. Like, uh, like Seth, I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name. And this is actually, it's a great book with a lot of examples, uh, hands-on, how you, how you can just uh, make your website a little bit better. I'm going to show you a few forms right now. Um, with uh, there are uh, some great forms and some less great forms and we're going to start with the less great forms like this and I would like to ask the audience if they spot anything at all which is not that great about this form does anyone see anything yeah it has a reset button it has a reset button <laughs> yeah uh, why should we have a reset button Reset buttons are not that useful. You can just leave the website. Or just go back and get to it again. And then it's also empty. When you got a, a large reset button, um, the chances that you will click it and everything you just filled in very patiently is gone. That's not nice. So reset buttons are not good. Anyone else? There are required fields everywhere. Well, not everywhere. This one's not required. but. <laughs> But it's required fields. But how do you know that they are required? Yeah, but it, nobody explains what the star means. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually it's actually saying that that you sh you should fill in 90210 everywhere. That, that's what it's saying in this form. So that's not right either. Um, those labels are red, and red is bad, and there's nothing bad about. It. Sorry? Yeah. Um, two, two things. One, of course, is the, uh, the info boxes are all out of line. Yeah, there's no flow at all. And then it says on there, warning, don't click the submit button twice. There is no... No, there's only a go button. <laughs> yeah. It's just the smallest one. Yes. Yeah. So, the submit button, the go button is the smallest, yeah. Um, and the largest one is the only sign up for the newsletter, which is not that great. Um, plus, there's a warning. Submit button. Don't don't press it twice. But this is something you, as a developer, you you don't have to put that there. You can just code it that it's. Uh, if you press it twice, nothing happens. So, yes. Sir. Um, also, checkboxes were opting in. Yeah. Chat. Yeah. And I actually was not really not very much friendly to Google, but which everyone had to do. But I'm also not sure if it's correct with uh, the legal system, like uh, the new European job laws. Absolutely not. No, <laughs> they can't be checked at all. Yeah. There's there's a lot of checkboxes. There's three, uh, and one is actually too many. Uh, there's three checkboxes and they're all checked, which is in, at least in Holland, it's it's not even legal. So that's not good. There's nothing right. Well, it's got a nice title. It says contact form, right? Yeah. Um, I'd say the capture image is missing some options. Exactly. Everything is wrong with the capture. Because you can read this. 
at least I can't, and there's no refresh button for this capture. So if you fill in the whole form, and you come, at, you come to the bottom and you're like, ah oh, shit, I can't read this, you have to do it all over again, because you... Yeah, you can use the reset button. But will it change the captcha? That's the question, right? No, nothing's cat. Nothing. Yeah. And there's spelling mistakes in, in, in there too. <laughs> yeah. So, and there's a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, commercial that right there at the bottom, which is screaming for attention. It's too long to grab. No one's going to fill it in the same long. I mean, why bother? No, probably not. They want to know too much. If, if, it, if it was a register form, maybe people would have done it, but this is a contact form. Sorry? No, you don't fill it in at all, no. But it's, it, you, you have to do it all, yeah. So, and there's also these, uh, these distracting lines, um, which are very unnecessary. The form is just plain ugly. That's always the first thing I see about this form. It, I created it myself. This is not an actual form, luckily. However, it's sad but true that most of the forms on the internet today look more like this than like something like this. Oh, this. Oh, this, for example. This is, in my opinion, a little bit better. Does anyone know what is right about this form? Yeah. It has a green call to action button that actually says what I'm going to do. It has a green call to action button. Yeah. It looks nice. Sure. It looks, it's not plain ugly, right? Anyone else? Yeah. There's uh, two tips for one of the fields, if you didn't know what to, uh, to fill out there. Uh, you mean the question mark? Yeah, the question mark. Yeah. yeah. It's got help if you don't know what to do, because it's email address or, or phone number. Could be confusing. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but if you press the uh, question mark, it could say, if you fill in your email address, uh, we will um, get back to you by email. If you fill in your phone number, uh, we will phone you. Or maybe you could even say that you can fill in both if you don't care. Yeah? Uh, privacy statement. Yeah, there's a privacy statement. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know what's going to happen with your data. Yes. It's not going to be all over the internet. Yeah? yeah. It's obvious which fields you have to fill out. Yeah, it says all fields are required. Just don't use a star sign on all the different fields. Just say if it's just three fields, all fields are required. What about uh, placeholders? Placeholders for what? HTML5 uh, placeholders. So that actually in, inside. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, the, the, yeah. Uh, you could do that as, a, that as well. But what are you going to put in there then? Yeah, but I can put I can put your name in there. No, I mean the text. Oh yeah, you you uh, placing the label inside of the yeah, but but then if you click it, the label is gone. So if you no, just so you wouldn't have both. Like first it has name, like that now. And within the text box, it's it's double mentioning again, like enter your name. Yeah, there could be an example in there. But uh, as far as inline labels, it could be helpful for larger forms. But if you click it, uh, then it's gone again. So you you can. Actually, when you fill in the whole form, you don't actually know what, what they asked you to fill in. So. But it's possible for, for uh, some forms. Yeah? You can expand the message field. You can expand the message field. Yes. Yeah, right, correct. Um, no, it, it doesn't have to be like this large. Is it clear? I'm not sure. I wanted to explain this in my mind. Okay, it's not clear that you no, can enlarge it. For me, it is, but uh, yeah. yeah. That, could be better than maybe, yeah. Um, there's two more things then, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you know what's going to happen before you fill in the form, and if you don't want to use this form, you can use the uh, the phone number to contact. Andrea. Uh, No, 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 no capture for a contact form. It's not necessary. You just have to delete it in your email if you get a lot of spam. So. You don't want to stop customers or clients to contact you because there's a capture in the way. This is really irritating. Yeah. How do you resolve the you know, security issues? I mean, if you have a capture, you're secure. Yeah. So how 
If you don't have a captcha, you'll get spam. That's what you mean. Yeah. But you also get spam. That's the downside. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a choice you have to make. If you don't want to delete email every day, uh, then you should use a CAPTCHA. But you also have the risk that potential customers won't contact you. Mm -hmm. But we found out that there's, there's not a lot of spam in our contact form and we don't have a CAPTCHA. So, I don't, is there? Oh, okay, so there's a lot of spam in our contact form, but I'm not aware of it because the technical guys are handling it for me, so I just let your technical guy handle it for you and there's no problem. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can stay that there. Yeah. So now I have another one uh, and there's a uh, something's good and something's wrong about it. Um, anyone know something that goes good about this. Let's start with the good things first. It looks nice, okay. Thank you. Something else? Andrea? You differentiated between your two buttons. Yeah, uh, and that's a good thing, right? Because there's uh, two different colors for the buttons. You got a, a primary call to action and a secondary call to action. However, there's also something wrong with these because it's got a cancel button and you don't need a cancel button. So, but it's it's great that it's uh, it's got two different colors. Um, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, if it will pop up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But even if there are a, a cancel button, I think it's placed wrong. I think it's placed uh, to the right. The cancel on the left and the register on the right. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, in in the book. There's a lot of. Uh, they had six, uh, they tested six different ways of placing the buttons, uh, centered, left and right, and uh, switched them. And they found out that uh, f about four or five of them are equally working as well as the other one. So it's just a choice uh, you have to make for uh, every customer wants something else. But yeah, you could test that on your own website, which whether works best. Someone? Yeah. Yeah, and it's not correct either. I just because it's yeah, and it could also be tap to select if you're using an eye device. Yeah, 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 exactly. This tap, yeah, tap could be could be used as well. Yeah, so no, no, it, it should be select your city or select your state, something like that. Yeah, or just select. Yeah, could also be. Well, we got the inline uh, inline help, of course. Uh, it only shows up when you are filling in the form, just to make clear that you have to enter both your street name and your street number instead what of two different fields. Uh, it doesn't say. So, yeah, they're cool fields. No, it doesn't say. So that's uh, it. Should be a statement on the bottom uh, which explains the star star sign. Yeah. Um, is the reason why city is a select box? I would probably have an input. Yeah, because there will be like, uh, how many cities are in the world? Yeah. Really much, yeah. Uh, an input field will be way better here as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we lost the ability to enlarge the message. Yeah. Uh, the city and state, shouldn't they be interchanged? Yeah, that would be better to, yeah. If you want to use select fields, you could better switch them. Yeah. Uh, the postal code is, is good here as well uh, because it's just a small field. You know how approximately how large a postal code or a zip code is going to, is going to be. It's never going to exceed 10 symbols. So you can just use a, a smaller field here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. When I fill in this form, when I press register, uh, and I made an error, I get something like this. And there's two good things about this, maybe even more. Um, there's an error at, at the top of the form, which says 
you did some or something went wrong. No, you did something wrong because a user can do anything wrong. Something went wrong. Uh, one or more fields contain errors or an error, and it says, "Please mark, uh, fi uh, please fix the marked fields and try to fill in the form again." So it it, it actually says what you have to do to uh, to fix the problem that was occurred. It's a red box, and a red means something went wrong, something something's bad. Plus, it has the the X uh, <laughs> icon there to uh, show it to people who who can't see colors that well. Uh, just give them a second way to see that something went wrong. Then, in the bottom of the field uh, of the form, uh, it's red again, and it's got the the X icon again. So you got the relationship between the the top of the form where something went wrong and the bottom of the form where you can actually see what you have to do. And then there's some help to or, or a message to help you uh, to to fix the problem. So that's uh, that's great about this one. Um, so I got five minutes left, uh, and I got some some uh, screenshots about the JMBL uh, submission form. Uh, yes, yes, sir, yeah. I just have to, uh, a comment on on this form. Yeah. is wrong, mm -hmm. that's actually the only reason why you're still on this page. So actually it should auto focus, auto -auto -focus uh, on that field, so automatically the, 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 the cursor uh, is at this field of code, so once you start typing it's actually right there. Yeah, but this, it's, it's, um, with this form it's a little hard, uh, oh, this form it's possible because it's a small form, yeah. But if you got a large form and you got the uh, mention at the top that something went wrong and you skip to the field at the bottom where something went wrong, then... Well, that brings me to my second point. Yeah? Actually, if the, if the field would be down the uh, viewing pane, that it should scroll down automatically. Uh, because exactly with large forms, even that it's uh, well labeled in the, in the red and it has the, the, the error icon, it's still hard to uh, distinguish. Yeah, maybe there should be a... Oh. Maybe there should be a, a link here to the field that actually went wrong, and then when you click it, you just scroll there and you can fix it. And that thing maybe has to be fixed then, and it stays in the field uh, in the screen until you fix every problem. That might be a great solution. It's very red, so contrast is, is terrible. This, yeah, yeah. If you <laughs> exactly, if you grayscale this, you can read it. So that's actually a thing that's not so great about the well, top the message. He can see anything. His red is the same as green. So. Red and green are not that great either.